Okay, welcome. Hi, my name is Sean Doyle. I am a, um, I'm a lawyer and I'm a poet and I've taught positive psychology at North Carolina State for, um, for almost 10 years. And what I thought I would do today is this program is entitled uh, Applied Poetics, um, Arts and Humanities in, in Times of Crisis. And this is, uh, is being broadcast live, but then also be recorded and it'll be available later. Um, and for those of you that are, are dialing in, there's a chat function. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we go along. Uh, there'll be a few specific questions I have for you, but otherwise, um, feel free to send me a note. What I want to do is, you know, I don't have any specific training in poetry or art or literature, um, but, it, but it's something that I've always found a great deal of meaning and solace and joy in and especially as things have been um uh the the, the times have been unusual and stressful and, and anxiety producing uh with the pandemic that's going on I, what what today is kind of my initial thoughts around what arts and humanities and poetics can do for us in times of crisis uh, and how they can help us tap into um, uh, what's most about us as human beings and, and hopefully bring us together as well. Um, as I said, these are just kind of initial thoughts. Um, um, I'd love to get your, your comments as we go along the way as I continue to refine these things. Um, and we'll take it, take it from there. So I'm gonna I actually put together a slide deck that I will share as we do this. Uh, let's see. Sorry, as I'm figuring this out. Whoops. Okay, so when I'm calling this this talk applied poetics, when when I talk about poetics, what I've got in mind is what um, the uh, the filmmaker Tarkovsky said when that he used the, the word poetry. When, when I speak of poetry, I'm not thinking about it in terms of a genre, a specific art form or specific um, way of, ex of uh, 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 tangible way of expressing, but rather poetry is an awareness of the world, a particular way of um, leading to reality. Oops, I've got a couple of you said you see the next slide coming. Um, which I don't know that that's, you know, hurts anything, but let me see if I can figure out how to change that. Um, uh, go to display settings on top. I, th I appreciate your help. Um, oh, I go. Um, how's that? Now, do you just see the um, the one slide? Okay, we'll, we'll take it from there. So when I talk about, um, oh, now somebody's saying it's cut off. Can you see the slides okay? Only part of the quote appears. All right, let me go back. If you see the presenter form, that will be okay. Um, Okay, how about that? So I assume you've got the presenter form now. And if, if, that's, if that's the case, that's fine. We're not going to reveal any secrets as we go along here. So um, I apologize for the, uh, the, the technical difficulties with this. So um, as I'd mentioned that when, I, when I'm talking about poetics in this presentation, it's, it's not the specific genre as much as a, an awareness of the world and a way of, of relating to reality. Um, Tarkovsky goes on to say 
that what the, the artist is more than just an explorer of life, um, but one who takes, uh, who creates great spiritual treasures, and that there's a, a spe that it's creating a special beauty that's the subject of poetry. And so that's, you know, as we look at what the function of art is and the function of poetics and what it can bring to us, I've got that in the back of my mind is about the great spiritual treasures. Um, so there's, there's something about special about the arts and about poetics that have lasted uh, throughout time. So, you know, we're all aware of the idea of the, the starving artist, you know, struggling to make their, their artwork. Um, but, you know, the, the image up on the screen is by Gao Jing Zhuan. He was a, uh, he is a, a Nobel Prize winning uh, novelist from China, um, who's also a painter. And when Jing Zhuan was writing, he was already under a lot of um, pressure from the, from the Chinese government and that if he had been caught with the manuscript Soul Mountain that he was working on, he would have been sent to prison or, um, or, or worse. And yet he wrote anyway, and yet he carried it anyway. And there was no guarantee that this 600 page novel would ever be seen by anyone. And yet there was still this urge to write, this urge to create. So there's something in the art form uh, that, that touches something inside of us that stays with us. In addition to Gao Jing Zhuan, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, another Nobel Prize winner, and, and one of the ones really credited with, with bringing down the, uh, the Soviet Union by broadcasting what was going on through his novels. He was bury, burying his manuscripts in gardens, uh, trying to smuggle them out of the country. Again, he would have been sent to Siberia and tortured or worse if he'd been caught with his, uh, with his art. Uh, and yet he created anyway. Um, in addition, we've got up on the screen um, some pictures of um, uh, some tapestries and some, some sewing from the um, uh, 1400s to the 1900s in China, where there was a knot, uh, it's called the forbidden stitch, um, that the, the, it was the stitching was so fine that often the seamstress would go blind from having to, to work on it. And so, um, so again, there someone's giving up their, their eyesight for this artwork that they were creating. Um, other examples, um, the, the Polish painter and writer, uh, Joseph uh, Kapazinski had written a book. Uh, oh, he, was, he was taken prisoner during World War II by the Soviets, was put in a Soviet prison camp and that he and his, uh, the other prisoners stayed alive by memories of Proust. Uh, Kapuscinski gave lectures on Proust to the others within the Soviet prison camp so that people could retain this sense of normalcy and beauty and that there's goodness in the world despite everything that's going on around them. Um, and then um, Doris Lessing, when she won the Nobel Prize in Literature, uh, she, in her Nobel Lecture, uh, she described uh, visiting a school in Zimbabwe um, where, you know, she talked about the, the difficult conditions there and the dirt floors and that often the, the children were having to write, um, write with sticks in the dirt. Um, and that what, what she said that people said to her is that when you get back to London, please send us books. Uh, they taught us how to read, but that we have no books. Uh, Lessing talks about how people begged for that. Um, so there's this hunger, there's this need. It's something that keeps us alive. It's something that, um, that touches something deep inside of us. Uh, Salman Rushdie, the author also talked about when he was a child, he was taught that if a book ever touched the floor, that they had to, to kiss it, that it was treated as something that was holy. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, there are various Faustian stories where people were willing to sell their soul to the devil for, for something, for, for honor or pride or power. Um, in the, uh, the Master and Margarita by Volkolkov, 
um, one of the characters ends up giving up her soul um, for art uh, so that the one that she loved could go on and produce his heart. So there may be uh, at least some arguments that there are some things worth giving up your soul for and, uh, and art may be one of them. And she made out a whole lot better than the other Faustian characters throughout time. So, so why poetry? Why art? What is it that it gives to us? Um, what is, um, what do we take away from it? What is the purpose of it? If you would, I'd love in the, um, in the chat function, you know, tell me what it is that, that you get out of, one, what's the art form that you're drawn to, whether it's, it's painting or whether it's poetry or whether it's literature or music, what are the things that you're drawn to and um, what is it that you get, get out of it? Go ahead and use the chat. Got beauty, sense of escape. I recognize a couple of the names on the chat. I know some of you are, are deep into literature and, it, and uh, the ideas that it sparks and things along those lines. Uh, the ability to express emotion, um, creating, uh, providing new views of the world, uh, bringing structure, that's wonderful. Um, an opportunity to get pain out. Yeah, these are all great. There's um, so many things. So, so one of the things is just, you know, art in, in its various forms can be just a simple way of escape. You know, in the middle of all this craziness that's going on, just to go and find a place that expresses some normalcy and escape. I see transcendence, identity with others. I mean, these are great everything that you've got coming in. Um, so escape is one of them. Um, of course, there's many different kinds of, of art and poetry and literature, um, and that not all of them are all gonna play the same functions. They're not all gonna uh, even have the same effect on, on the same in, on, di on different people. Um, so escape's one of them. Um, one thing that poetics and art can provide is, uh, positive emotions. Um, Martin Seligman recently, uh, the, the founder of Positive Psychology, has recently been talking about that in the midst of uh, the anxiety and the, the uh, pandemic that's going on now, what people need are positive emotions. Um, once we get out of it, we need more resilience, we need more hope and optimism to see how we rebuild. But right here and right now, while we're going through it, what can we use to spark those positive emotions. Um, there's certainly happy feelings, uh, might be a sense of curiosity, it could be intellectually stimulating, or even um, generate a sense of awe. Derek Walcott, who's one of my all-time favorite poets, had written um, uh, in his poem, Volcano, one could abandon writing for the slow burning signals of the great to be, to be instead the ideal reader, making uh, ruminative, voracious, making the love of masterpieces superior to attempting to repeat or outdo them. To be the greatest reader in the world, at least it requires all, which has been lost to our time. So many people have seen everything, and he goes on, so many take thunder for granted, how common is the lightning? How lost the leviathans we no longer look for. Um, so uh, art can serve that function also. It can generate a sense of awe in us. Um, and then um, another thing that, that the arts can provide is a sense of home. Um, so Martha Rothko, um, the, the painter had, had said at one point, silence is so accurate. So the sense of home can be both, um, you know, kind of going to an art museum where it's clean and it's quiet and you've got the beauty around you of the artwork. Um, that could be one aspect of it. Um, there could be, um, uh, it, it could be when I, when I read Walcott or, or Czeslaw and Wosh, the poet, or Walt Whitman, there's a sense of home. It, 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 there's a grounding to it. Some of it's the images, 
some of it's the sound of the language itself, but there's something about the arts that for us can provide a sense of safety and shelter and home. Um, another thing that, um, that the arts and poetics can provide is hope. By pointing to the beautiful things in our lives, um, there's so much good out there around us all day long that we don't even notice because it's so easy to get caught up in everything that we have to do and all the stresses and the challenges. Um, art, one function that it serves is it, it reminds us of the good that's out there and that there are things that we can hold on to for hope. Um, what about, uh, you know, certainly there's lots of literature and lots of uh, artwork that shows pretty alarming things and pretty troubling things. Um, another function that the arts and poetics serve is it reminds us that we're not alone um, by showing the hard things in life, the, the things that are difficult and challenging and um, unjust. You know, a lot of times when we're going through things, we feel like we're the only ones in the world that are. And so that poetics one thing that it can offer is that reminder that we're not in this alone, that we've got other people with us as we go along. Um, and of course, it also connects us to the world um, that uh, um, there's a, sometimes we, um, there's this image of, of the artist or the poet as being a disconnected dreamer. Um, you know, there's dis disconnected lawyers, the disconnected accountants too. So it's not just uh, not just the artist, but instead, um, what um, Derek Walcott, the uh, the poet, one thing that he had said was that the teaching of poetry and learning of a craft is the greatest thing that can happen in any republic, because if you learn the craft of verse, then you can't be fooled easily. You don't take in the rhetoric. You don't buy into it, that, you, that the artist has to be devastatingly honest with themselves. So what the, what the art does is it helps create a, a, the, the, um, a mindfulness and a greater connectedness to the world. Um, and so when we see in a film by, so this is from uh, Tarkovsky's film, um, uh, Ivan's Childhood, um, you know, there's so much around us every day that's that's um, that grab that 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 we're just kind of sleepwalking through most of our days. Don't necessarily notice the things that are around us. Um, art can point us to the simple little things. Um, and when the artist or the poet or the uh, the filmmaker is choosing their image or their shot, what they're doing is they're focusing on something that's important something that may have slipped beneath our notice. Um, and um, so on the, the one level, the base, most basic level, it's, it's alerting us to kind of those little things that slip past us. Um, but on another level, it's showing us what's important to the character. Um, and then what ends up happening as a result is that it, it provides insight into our own lives, into what, what may be important to us as well. Um, and makes us aware of those things in our own lives. So the arts and poetics have that opportunity to connect us, uh, connect us deeper to the world. Um, it can also change the way that we see the world. Um, sometimes it's that, that what that is, a, is, is just an affirmation that if you feel like the world is wonderful and beautiful, there'll absolutely be arts and, and poetry out there that uh, validate that for you. If you feel like everything's miserable and that, um, you know, everything is, uh, is just falling to pieces, there's certainly going to be things out there that can validate that as well. Um, the other thing it will do in, in this respect is it, you know, in addition to, to validating or affirming, it could also change, it could advocate a certain worldview. So the artist may be presenting a picture of something, the, the beauty of a simple life, or you know how how um, maybe alerting us to important uh, social or political issues, um, and so in that sense, uh, art can advocate for a certain worldview, um, and then it can also change the world. Um, 
uh, Abraham uh, Joshua Heschel, Rabbi Heschel, who that's, um, that's him uh, next to Martin Luther King. Um, he was one of the, the ones who really, uh, early ones bringing attention to, to Martin Luther King to, um, and very supportive of everything that he was doing. Um, he said that words um, themselves are sacred, uh, that they, that they um, and one thing that he would remind people is that the Holocaust did not begin with the building of crematoria. Hitler did not come to power with uh, tanks and guns, but it all began with uttering evil words, um, with defamation and with language and with, with propaganda. The words we use create worlds. Uh, he, um, they must, and as a result, we need to use them carefully. Um, so words are, have that power, art has that power, both for the positive and the negative. Um, and it's one of the reasons that in Plato's Republic, Plato wanted to ban what he called the bad poets, the ones that were denying the beautiful and denying the ideal and, uh, and promoting images of the world that took away from people's well-being. I don't think we should do that, but that's, um, it, it sort of recognizes that art has the, an incredible power over us in that, that regard. Okay, so we talked about all of these as some things that art can do for us. Um, again, not every type of art, not every type of um, a form of it is going to do all of these things. Certain people are going to respond differently to certain things, but there's a whole nother layer as well. I mean, all of this, there's a lot of value in these just by themselves, but there's other things um, in addition. And that's um, that there's a reciprocal relationship between poetics and, and our lives. Um, and so before I, um, before I did this, you know, arranged this talk, I sent out a note to some of my friends on, on Facebook and some other places asking a question and asking if there are artists or even works of art, again, broadly, broadly uh, construed, um, that move you to a sense of e e stasis, kind of that, that ecstasy. Um, not just that you like the artist or that you're, you're moved by the work, but that it's an almost a religious experiment, uh, experience for you. Um, and so we got a whole bunch of, of people wrote back. If you could, in the comments, you know, just identify, are there ones that, that, that it's, it's a spiritual experience for you? Um, the encounter that you have either with a particular work or, um, or, you know, maybe it's the, the whole over of a, of a, um, an artist. So we've got Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, Cezanne, Wagner, um, yeah, so music especially can be unbelievably powerful. Um, some, go ahead, keep sending some in. Uh, some of the things we heard back about were um, uh, Kadinsky, some of his work. I mean, that's just magnificent. Um, and it speaks to us on a level that's not linear, that's not cognitive, but it's touch, touching something else at a deeper level. We've got more people saying, uh, Hopper and Van Gogh's brush strokes. Again, something like Van Gogh's brush strokes. It's not um, the story. It's not even the image. But there's something else there on a more, um, more human level, touching us at the level of intuition and at the level of emotion. Um, so Kadinsky was one thing. Uh, John Coltrane, who was actually canonized, who is Saint. Uh, St. John Coltrane. Um, and, um, you know, so these are some of the, some of the other names that came up. Uh, Faulkner, uh, Sar Jose Saramago, the, the, the Portuguese novelist. Um, uh, Gar Garcia Lorca wrote about flamenco music and referred to it as deep song because it was touching something on a totally different level. Um, Joseph Campbell, had written about Joyce and Finnegan's Wake and Ulysses that, um, that here it's language, but that it's something that keeps us off center so that because we're off center, it allows us then to see something different about the world um, that we might not have, have noticed before. Um, 
So, um, so in terms of this poet, uh, this reciprocal relationship between poetics and our lives, there are a few things going on there. Um, the first one, oh, somebody mentioned Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Marquez, his work, it's, um, they're like 300 page poems. They're just uh, miraculous. Um, um, but in terms of the, uh, one of the things that the arts do to provide this, um, this, this meaning relationship is prov prov providing a sense of communion. So it could be as simple as, uh, you know, when that we're experiencing it with another. Um, you, you could be meeting in a book group and, and talking through the works of um, uh, Dostoevsky or others and really connecting with other people around something or sharing time at a gallery together. So at the most basic level, it's, it's got that opportunity to allow human connections between people with art being kind of the vehicle to get us there. Um, it creates a relationship with people across history. When we read Herodotus, his histories from, um, uh, he was known as the first historian, we're not reading it for his historical record. There's all sorts of things there that have been found to be questionable um, at best at times. Um, but we're reading it for the, for the sustained human drama, the things that continue to be relevant and valuable to us as human beings today. We can get that in a work of art. You can get it when you look at, at a painting or when you read, a, um, read Herodotus or, or when you're reading Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you're connecting with a different time and a different place with other human beings who are going through all the same stuff that we're going through as well. Um, there's also, um, there's the opportunity to commune with the artist directly. So Rothko, so here's a, a photograph of his number 14. Rothko said, um, you have sadness in you and I have sadness in me. My works are a place where the sadnesses could meet and therefore both of us can feel less sad. You know, something like one of Rothko's paintings, uh, it, it's remarkable if you uh, talk with people that love Rosco, Rothko's art, that it is, it, they really speak about it in religious terms. And the first several times I saw something about Rothko, I, you know, I totally didn't get it. I mean, here's, you know, my, when my kids were little, they could, could do this with just swatches of, of paint. Um, but the more you, so it's not the art itself. Part of it is the way that we're approaching the art and what we're coming to it um, so that we can hear what the artist is saying back to us. And so since I've started to look at Rothko more and see what's in there, recognizing, uh, I mean, that this quote saying it is that this, this is not a story. It's not um, any sort of linear narrative but there's an emotion in there. And if you just sit, if you allow yourself to be in the presence of it, whether it's, it's Rothko's art or Coltrane's music or Walcott's poetry, if you allow yourself to be in its presence, it's going to, to uh, there's the, the possibility that it will touch you on the level of intuition and emotion, which is something that so often we leave behind and, and um, uh, to our own detriment, because you know that's that's a fundamental part of who we are as human beings, and yet so often we we ignore it in the workplace and we ignore it in our homes, and it gets buried over by all the busy stuff that we have to do. By taking this time with poetry and art, it's an opportunity for us to tap into those sorts of things. Um, so there's that um, communion we talked about. It can also connect us to our sense of humanity. Um, so, uh, so William Carlos Williams, uh, in his uh, uh, in one of his poems, had had a line: um, "It's hard to get the no the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there." Um, again, he, the, the, what the arts are speaking to, they're talking to us on a level that's not um, cognitive and that, that necessarily makes sense, 
but it doesn't have to make sense if we if we set that aside and listen for the truth that's there. Um, sometimes it touches you in the sound. So the, the first, um, one of the first poets that, uh, you know, I, you know, I'd have poetry classes in high school and middle school and just totally didn't get it and didn't, um, it didn't stick with me at all. Um, and then at one point I was reading Dylan Thomas and was just carried away by the sounds of the language. I was trying to understand what these lines meant. And that, that wasn't, um, I wasn't able to access that early on. But by just stop worrying about what it meant and just enjoying the sound of it, that then the meaning was able to sink in. So when he had a line, um, and I wooed whoever I would with my wicked eyes, that the poet is getting inside of you and touching that human side of you. Or Keats, she looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. There's something about the sound of that that touches us. It's like the Sanskrit um, symbol Om, where it's touching, it's, it's something across the universe and, um, and uh, uh, that, that, cuts across culture that you don't need translation for, that um, tapping into something that's very human, um, human about us. Um, so it connects us to our humanity. And of course, I mean, this is all circling around um, a spiritual experience with art. Um, and when we um, think of the spirit, there, the, the psychologist or psychiatrist, George Valiant, talks about certain spiritual emotions as being those that bring us together as human beings. Um, uh, compassion and kindness, this, the, anything that unites us as human beings, those are our human experience, are our, um, our spiritual emotions. And I, I, up on the screen, I've got a quote from Elie Wiesel um, where, where he was talking about prayer, the, the other aspects of it that aren't on the screen. Um, he said, what is prayer? You take words, everyday words, and all of a sudden they become holy. Why? Um, um, well, you know, what, he asked what's going on there. And then he, he concludes it with this, that words, when they bring you closer to the prisoner in his cell, or to a patient who's dying on his bed alone, or to a starving child, then it is a prayer. Art can be a form of prayer too. You know, earlier I had this screen up from the uh, the picture from the Tarkovsky film. All of Tarkovsky's images in his films, um, they connect to us on another level. They they cut across times so that you can relate to these characters that are in a totally foreign circumstance to to where I am, and um, and in that way it serves as a as a prayer. Um, and, uh, and then the, the last thing that we've got um, about this relatedness um, is a sense of meaning um, that, uh, you know, David Lynch, and so I've got a, a picture of a Jackson Pollock on the, up on the screen, which again, when first experienced it, it just, it didn't make any sense because I was trying to think of it in terms of, um, of a cognitive, narrative sort of, of uh, item. Um, David Lynch, the filmmaker on the top of the screen, uh, I don't know why people ex expect art to make sense when they accept the fact that life doesn't make sense. There's so much going on in our lives. You know, one of the, one of the keys to meaning is being able to craft a narrative around things, and yet we can't always do that. Um, we can't always do it in a, in a cognitive sense, um, but we can still sense the meaning of things. There's this notion of the felt meanings of the world because they're talking to us on a, on a totally different level. Um, and all of it comes down to, um, there's a, um, uh, the, our approach to the world. So it's not necessarily the form of art. It's not necessarily the things that are around us that are um, that are communicating this directly. It's there waiting for us to notice them. And so 
in psychology, there's this notion of explanatory style, an optimistic explanatory style, a, um, a pessimistic explanatory style. So it's, it's, everybody's familiar with the idea of the glass and, um, you know, is it half empty, half full? And then they use that to talk about um, optimism and pessimism. But what, what that's looking at is the dispositional optimism or the dispositional pessimism. What is the disposition of the glass right now? You know, it's half empty. Well, you could say that the glass is half empty and still be an optimist I mean, when it comes down to explanatory style. So how did the glass get that way? Is it always empty? Is it all, you know, they always bring me an empty glass or, um, you know, did I drink some? Did I spill some? The next one will be, uh, will have more in it. Just as there's this explanatory style on optimism and pessimism, I think all of life, there's a, there's a poetic explanatory style that we can look around us and say, yeah, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that I don't like or I do differently or that I wish were some other way. But there's also so much beauty and so much joy and so much to hang on to and people coming together and supporting one another every single day if you just open your eyes and look for it. Art can serve as, a, and again, art in the broad sense, can serve uh, to sort of bracket us off from the rest of our lives by removing us from what's going on in the day to day um, so that we can focus on that. And by taking us out of our everyday, allowing us to experience things, touching us on that emotional level, the intuitive level, it then opens us up again so that we can then look back into our lives and notice the good and the beauty and the relevance and the meaning that's there all along. And in that sense, um, that's what I mean about the reciprocal relationship between life and art is that um, where art is a metaphor for our lives, but in the same sense, uh, again, going back to Rabbi Heschel, um, that the meaning of life comes in living our life as if it were a work of art. Um, so these are just, as I said, just a few ideas to, that I wanted to scratch out and share. Uh, the idea of these, these talks was um, just to be, you know, 30 minutes or so and then open that up to any sort of, of questions or, or dialogue that people want to have. Um, you know, I'd love to, you know, in the chats function, if you've got anything that you want to ask or things that you want to point out or, or thoughts on it, I'd love to hear, hear what folks have to say. Okay, well, thanks. I really appreciate everybody's time and hope you enjoyed it. And again, these are just initial thoughts around this. I'm going to keep playing around with them. Um, if you uh, have not, um, uh, if, if you haven't registered at my website before, it, it's johnshawndoyle.com. Um, register on there, You'll, it, it'll have my contact information. I'd love to hear from you as you think about this stuff more, if you have things that you want to, um, you know, ideas that you wanna share or, or ideas that you think I could do, use to tweak it, I'd love that. Um, so uh, please go check out my website, send me a note, um, I'd love to stay in touch. All right. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, have, a, have a great rest of your day.